me high in my basement, ocean in my pipes, no trust fund in the 215. Welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames. This is season one, Books and Bitters, Adventures in Book Collecting, in which we explore the stories behind fascinating objects in the Rosenbach's collection and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern day life. In this episode, I'll introduce you to Judith M. Gustin, one of my valued mentors and colleagues here at the Rosenbach, to learn more about the fascinating and perhaps unexpected history of our institution, the composition of our collections, and how she, as a curator, studies and interprets our objects to the public. I'm sitting with Judy right now in the breathtakingly beautiful parlor on the first floor of the Rosenbach home, and we'll let the beautiful artworks and objects surrounding us inspire our conversation about the museum and library. Thanks for joining us in the parlor for this special conversation. In terms of square footage, the Rosenbach is small by many museum standards, but visitors to our historic townhouses on a tree-lined residential street near Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia have plenty to explore when they walk through our doors. From an evocative mid-19th century Philadelphia townhouse filled with beautiful antiques to one of the world's most distinguished libraries of rare books and manuscripts, it's a lot to take in. As we kick off the Rosenbach Podcast's first season, I want to give you a good introduction to our organization, our collections, and how you can learn more about the Rosenbach online and on site. I'm sitting today in the historic house with the person who is probably best equipped to fill in the details for us. My guest today, Judith M. Gustin, is curator and director of collections here at the Rosenbach. She graduated from Smith College with an A.B. in Classical Languages and Literatures and from Yale University with an M.A. in Classics. She later earned a Master's in American Material Culture from the Winter Tour Program at the University of Delaware. At the Rosenbach, Judy works with a wide range of collections, from the museum's single historic Japanese manuscript to its significant American historical collections. She has also worked with the Judaica collections in exhibitions, programs, as well as conservation projects and significant acquisitions. When not working, Judy enjoys travel, particularly to visit family in the southwest United States, where she is an avid hiker. At home, she keeps busy with ongoing improvements to her historic Center City Philadelphia house. Judy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Alex. It's great to be here. So before we delve into the details of the Rosenbach and its collections, tell our listeners a little more about yourself and what led you to pursue a career in museums. Well, um, if you take it from my family, um, I was born a curator, um, even though I pursued this um, avenue of work um, a little bit later in life than most people make those choices. I um, always wanted to organize my stuff, and one of the first gifts I asked for was a little shelving unit so that I could organize things in my bedroom. Um, And, um, you know, it also, for them, being a curator means a certain amount of um, not only organizational ability, but neatness, and so they were always shocked to find that I'd wear my best clothes to the sandbox and never get dirty. Um, So clearly, they thought I was aiming for this kind of work. But really, it took a long time for me to um, determine what I wanted to do as a career. So I followed a very circuitous kind of path um, before I determined that I didn't want to, um, you know, go into academia um, and that I didn't want to do something entirely outside of this field. But um, what I find now, looking back, is that all of the other maybe nine small careers I had prior to being here, um, actually helped me think about um, how our collections can teach us. um, And um, they actually do help a great deal in the technicalities and other logistics around um, really stewarding a collection. So um, if people are interested in, in being a curator or working with collections at some point, there's nothing that's lost um, if you're doing something else first. Interesting. So one of the things that I have noticed in recent years is that the word, the words curator and curate get thrown around a lot these days in many different disciplines, in different realms of popular culture and so on. 
What exactly is a curator? And what is the path by which you ended up here at the Rosenbach? Well, you know, I'm so glad in a way that um, for many years now, you're right, um, a lot of people have been wanting to associate themselves with the kind of work that we do. Um, I always wonder whether um, anyone knows what a curator does. That's the question I get the most from people that I don't know who I run into, like, you know, the person sitting next to me in the, on the airplane or what have you. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I used to refer to curators as, um, you know, intellectuals with really strong backs. Um, we do a lot of hands-on work, um, and that often means, you know, moving things in a small institution particularly. Um, we have fewer, um, you know, other professionals to help us with that kind of work. We don't have art handlers. Um, we don't have conservators here. Um, so really, you know, we, we don't have a lot of people to, uh, to paint, to move, you know, exhibition cases. Um, and to do a lot of that physical labor. Um, so in some ways, you know, my little joke is, is a little bit correct. Um, but really, um, our job is first and foremost to, on the one hand, steward the collections, which means to care for them, to um, refine them, to grow them, um, and to make sure that they are, um, you know, what the institution most needs to do its work and to help our colleagues in that, in that respect when it comes to having access to the collections and also make sure that the public has access to those collections. Uh, the other piece that we do is an interpretive function. And people who have um, the title of curator generally have um, an education that includes um, the, the theory and practice of interpretive activities, um, whether it's creating exhibitions, um, writing catalogs, um, doing programming around the objects in the collections. So I would say, you know, just briefly, that's kind of what we're doing. So this episode is the second episode in the first season of our, of our podcast, and I'd really like to take some time to make sure that our listeners have a sense of what our institution is. Can you um, give a, a basic introduction to the Rosenbach as an institution in terms of our public function, and also the, the nature of our collections with specific reference to how the institution was established by our two founders? So... The Rosenbach is now the contemporary heir, to, or heiress, um, to, um, to our founders' work, lives, and their collections. So we have two founders who were brothers, um, who um, were both collectors and practitioners. Um, they owned a business um, of selling rare books and manuscripts and uh, fine art and antiques. So. Um, we now have a collection that is um, comprised of um, both their collections that they left, and those were split too between things that they bought in order to sell and that they wanted to keep for their own collections. And over the years, um, you know, the founding of the institution was 1954. We're by no means the oldest museum that exists, but we have had a significant history as an institution um, that opens its doors to the public. Um, and so since then, there have been a succession of curators who have added to our founders' collection, so much so that the collections that we are most known for have largely been made up by the successive curators since our founder's time. And the collection itself has added um, significant works to the tune of uh, increasing by about a third since our founder's day. So what you see here is um, a little bit of everything, yet we have maintained over time a coherent collecting strategy um, that follows what our founders did, that follows the outlines of the collections that they created, um, and that is um, you know, malleable enough that we can make sure that it adapts to uh, you know, both current standards and current needs. Um, so although you know, when you walk into a space like the parlor where we're sitting now, and it looks very old, um, it in fact has conversations that are set up within it and among the objects in it that really do reflect on our own interests in our own time. Tell me more about that. As, as you mentioned, we're sitting in this 
beautiful space. I feel like I'm in you know, 18th century Philadelphia, early 19th century Philadelphia, and yet you, as the curator of this space, um, constructed this to serve educational purposes. Can you tell me a little bit about what stories are surrounding us and some of the artifacts? Maybe, to the extent possible, with your words, paint a picture for our listeners about what this space looks like. So the parlor, when most people enter it, the thing they're most struck by is the collection of portraits um, that live on three walls um, out of the four. The, uh, the fourth one is the windows. Um, so um, this is a gallery, essentially, of portraits that represent uh, a number of people in the Gratz family um, of Philadelphia, one of the city's oldest Jewish families, and certainly one of its most important Jewish families. Um, so people may ask, OK, I I'm at the Rosenbach. This is a place founded by the Rosenbach brothers. You know, this looks like it should be um, a series of family portraits. And in fact, that's what it is. Um, the Rosenbach brothers were related to the Gratz family. Um, through um, an adoption between the two families um, in the 19th century. So these are their relatives, and these are important relatives, particularly to Dr. Rosenbach, A.S.W. Rosenbach, um, the rare book and manuscript dealer and collector, who was trained um, as you know in both literature and history, but also was an expert in early American Judaica. It was very important for him to maintain, um, in a public way, the connection to this family, um, whose founding member, Michael Gratz, whose portrait is here above the fireplace. Um, so he obviously is the head of this family. Um, he was active in supporting the revolution um, through uh, both his funds and his personal activities, um, bringing supplies into cities that were blockaded during the revolution. Um, and his uh, family, re as represented by these portraits, um, is also made up of, as he was, great philanthropists, business people, um, uh, one uh, a soldier in the War of 1812, um, and particularly the women um, headed up by Rebecca Gratz, one of his daughters, um, also a great philanthropist um, and uh, somebody who is historically remembered um, as very important in the continuation of Jewish culture here from the earliest days into the present by being the founder of the Hebrew school movement in America. Um, so these portraits are very important, and also some of them speak to Dr. Rosenbach's connection between himself um, in his time and the other Gratz descendants during that time, and how he cultivated that relationship, and how both he and his brother Philip collected objects that belonged to the Gratz family. Um, in order to preserve that connection, having a foothold, a sense in a sense, in the revolution and in early American Jewish culture that they wanted to talk about and exert um, in their own collecting. And it's not just the portraits, correct? There are other pieces of decorative art in this space that also reinforce the Gratz family's importance in early Philadelphia. That's right. Um, we have um, one piece of furniture in particular, a desk and bookcase that belonged to Rachel Gratz, another of the daughters in the family, um, that came down through the family um, and was eventually uh, donated to our collection by a collector who actually found it um, in a a, in an antique dealer's shop um, in Canada, where it ended up as the, the generations of Gratzes moved from Philadelphia to Montreal. Um, and so um, this is a piece that's had some life traveling. But what has stayed with it during this time is a collection of books um, that belong to various members of the Gratz family. And so it's, you know, for us as a uh, museum of the written word, um, it's really interesting for us to be able to see not only how books were stored by this family in this desk and bookcase, but also to understand what this family read in part, 
Um, there are books that belong to them that we also have in the collection that did not travel with this bookcase. But that's you know one way of sort of bridging um, the the two collections that we have, the fine and decorative arts with the, the library collections, um, where furniture like this um, was actually active in storing books over time. Um, we also have other pieces in the collection here that include, um, and these are just the ones in the parlor, uh, a washstand that Benjamin Gratz, the youngest um, child of Michael Gratz um, and the youngest of his siblings, um, that he bought from the estate, the estate of um, Joseph Bonaparte, Napoleon's brother, who was the King of Spain. He moved to Bordentown, New Jersey, um, and had a significant mansion there. Um, when his estate had to be dismantled after his death, a lot of things were sold at public auction, and everyone in Philadelphia wanted to take part in this and have something that was connected to the Bonaparte family. So Benjamin chose this washstand that now sits between the two windows in the parlor and holds on top of it a traveling grooming set that belonged to another brother in the family, Joseph Gratz, who was um, active in uh, the first troop and fought in the War of 1812. Um, he was uh, a very scholarly man um, and also someone who was very worldly, including a lot of travel. And you can imagine that this traveling grooming set um, was something that he had with him in his travels. It's nothing like the kinds of um, equipment we currently travel with. Um, uh, it's, it looks like it's really hard to take along, but it makes us realize that um, well-to-do people at that time uh, would have had servants to help with their travel and would have had a lot of staff wherever they went to help move their stuff with them. Um, but it also is a reminder that a lot of the material we see around us in the parlor was made by uh, people who didn't have either much income that resulted as, their, uh, as a, a, a product of their activities in making this material or by forced labor. Um, and in that, by that, I mean slavery. Um, so in looking at that traveling groom, grooming set, we can see materials that were harvested, the kinds of wood that were harvested probably by um, enslaved people in areas around the world um, that uh, were largely comprised of people of color. Um, so it is just a reminder that American history is a very uh, difficult topic um, to present to the public, to discuss with the public, and that it can be really um, helpful to constantly look at the objects we have with a relationship to um, how the problems that we, um, and the, the problems and difficulties that we encounter in the present in realizing the impact of our cultural history um, how these objects can help speak to the origins of those issues. One thing that you mentioned is the relationship at the Rosenbach between our museum collections, the fine art, the, dec the decorative art material that visitors see in the historic house itself, and our rare books and manuscripts. And I'm wondering, do you think that is a, a unique feature of the Rosenbach collections? Are, are there a lot of other museums and libraries and historic houses that bring those aspects together? And secondly, can you tell me about a certain book here at the Rosenbach that I know has played a very prominent role in your own uh, journey you know, to, to this institution and your own research, that being an almanac that once belonged to Michael Gratz? Well, the relationship um, between and among objects here across media um, is in some ways a phenomenon of being, of our being the, um, the result of a collector's collection. I think that because Dr. Rosenbach really wanted his own collecting to speak to both the people that he did business with, so in other words, his buyers, and to uh, the people that he wanted to educate, um, he wanted them to, to speak in, in concert. Um, so that one thing supported the next. The relationships between and among books were important, between books and manuscripts, between objects and books and manuscripts. Um, so I think all of those things are really a result of his collecting genius in part, 
um, and just a result of you know his intellectual interests. So um, he really did give us a good clue about how um, educating with all of these things together uh, provides a very um, you know solid uh, background for people to 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 sort of learn from because as you know we all learn differently. Um, we all have different aesthetic and visual um, sort of preferences, um, and sometimes it just reinforces the message you get from one thing when you're actually putting it right next to another. So you've asked me about um, a book here or a piece of uh, printed ephemera um, that is very important to me and always has been. I was a researcher here at the Rosenbach before I was an employee. Um, and I did the research for my winter tour thesis on um, a single very small object, a pocket almanac owned by Michael Gratz, whose portrait is here in the parlor. Um, and it was actually work I did before Michael Gratz's portrait arrived here in the parlor. So um, Dr. Rosenbach collected materials from his family, the Gratz family, um, when he was a collector. And some of the items that he collected were a set of um, three pocket almanacs from Michael Gratz, you know, owned by Michael Gratz, and um, inscribed by Michael Gratz. So it's both a printed almanac, these are three things, um, both printed and manuscript, which give us not only what was the intention of the creator and printer of these things, but then the response that Michael Gratz gave to the material that was inside these pocket almanacs. The one that I focused on was a pocket almanac from 1777. So we're already talking about the early years of the revolution um, in which Michael Gratz was uh, financially and you know, personally, physically involved. Um, so he's telling us a story about himself not by using some of the more traditional means of annotating for pocket almanacs. A lot of people who own these, and they were very widely owned, uh, would, would inscribe them with uh, some of their financial records, uh, what they did every day, um, you know, really things that were tied up in the calendar that's, that uh, shows up in, in these almanacs. But Michael Gratz inscribed in that 1777 almanac a Hebrew calendar. Um, and this is the only extant survival of such a document, although we know from family writings that this was a habit of the Gratz family. And they saw it through their own admission as a way of connecting family with other Jewish family members across geography and through their culture um, throughout time so that they could take part in what is um, a millennial old practice um, in Jewish culture, um, you know, recognizing and celebrating a series of holidays, Sabbaths, Torah readings, um, all of this over time, and just this connection to their faith in um, an environment where they were a huge minority. Um, and by huge minority, I mean at their time, probably about 0.01 or 0.02 percent of the American population. Um, and I'm not sure whether those numbers actually include the enslaved population, so it would make them an even smaller minority if you include who is actually living here. Um, so for me, this was a way of interpreting the diversity in Philadelphia and the beliefs surrounding the, um, the cultural position of Jews in early America um, who were previously, previously largely thought to be attempting to quickly assimilate into the larger population. Um, they assimilated in some ways, but they also differentiated themselves through their practice of faith um, and through their obvious practice of faith. Um, so this little book enabled me to understand how that faith was practiced and how it intersected with their um, taking part in uh, civic culture in Philadelphia and in America uh, more largely expressed um, and how they saw themselves and their future here. It sounds like Dr. Rosenbach made a point, as you mentioned, of collecting Gratz family materials. The three almanacs you've described were 
the product of his collecting impulse. But a lot of the material that we see in the, in, in the parlor today, are, these are artifacts that were acquired after Dr. Rosenbach's time, and indeed while you have been curator here. Am I correct? Yes. Um, I, I did have a large role to play in the collection of these portraits, um, in part as a result of my work on my thesis, which was on Michael Gratz's pocket almanac. Um, I should say that when I arrived here um, to do my research for my thesis, there were two prominent Gratz portraits here, um, a few more that were related to them in the collection on the whole. But the two uh, came to the Rosenbach shortly after it opened as a museum to the public. Um, and those were uh, a small portrait of Rebecca Gratz and a small portrait of Benjamin Gratz, brother and sister, um, siblings who were uh, parented by Michael Gratz and his wife, um, Miriam Gratz. Um, but they didn't come here during Dr. Rosenbach's lifetime. Um, he wasn't running a museum when he was alive. He had no real need to decorate the walls um, and to tell stories about the collections that he later left to the museum. But immediately after um, Philip Rosenbach's death, he survived um, uh, his brother by about a year, and then the museum followed a year later. Um, the initial curator contacted um, the Gratz family descendant who owned those portraits and had previously offered them to Dr. Rosenbach, who um, was slow to take her up on that offer. Um, but so that curator brought um, those portraits here immediately after the opening of the museum. Um, and they started what was then um, an active, continued collecting of Gratz material. When I arrived here, um, we were very grateful to a number of donors who helped us establish this collection of portraits um, by Thomas Sully, by Gilbert Stewart, and by G.P.A. Healy of uh, other Gratz siblings. Um, and um, they helped us um, really establish a way of telling the story of these people, their family, their experience in early Philadelphia, um, and, um, and really just start the discussion about diversity, about family, about collecting, um, and about the, the lives and works of, of these people in, in Philadelphia civic culture. It strikes me as such a wonderful example of the curator's work that over the course of our institution, we had some seed materials connected to the Gratz family that were gathered by someone you know, primarily interested in family history and building a personal collection, and then you know, subsequent generations of the curator's gaze have really allowed this collection to blossom in such a way that it's hard to imagine materials that feel more at home at the Rosenbach, and yet they have been, this collection has been very carefully constructed over, over many generations. I think that, you know, all of our collections um, act like that expansion on our founder's vision. Um, we see that in our library collections, and we see that here in our fine and decorative arts collections as well, that they started something that we continue um, and refine as we move forward in a way of making all of these sort of sub-collections within our larger collection um, speak to um, modern needs um, and answer modern questions. Um, and also work with um, you know family that that Dr. Rosenbach had had cultivated um, during his lifetime, um, and um, and we we couldn't be more grateful to the contemporary descendants of the Gratz family for their support of of this method of collecting, um, and um, you know enabling us to to expand on the stories that were told by smaller collections in our founders' time and making them uh, you know more tailored to a modern audience. If there is a listener to this podcast episode who has not visited the Rosenbach before, how would you recommend that he or she you know, pay a visit to the parlor and engage with these artifacts? Well, I think um, trying to discern or uncover the stories here, uh, I mean, 
You know, not only are we talking about the things that, that we've been discussing, um, family and history, um, diversity, um, we see in the parlor objects that speak to a, a growing and changing understanding of gender, um, a, an interest in um, the past in our country of, you know, what was formerly sort of described just as exoticism, um, to expand that into what we now want to talk about as um, the sort of the issue of cross-cultural understanding internationally. Um, we see stories here that talk about um, trade and craftsmanship um, and how those things evolved over time into the development of modern technologies and the, the birth of the middle class. Um, so you may come into the parlor and at first, um, you know, some people I imagine would sort of recoil because they would think of this as, you know, simply a reflection of the, uh, the processes and aesthetics of wealth. But in fact, there are a lot of hidden stories here that show more about um, who's involved in the creation of these things, who sees them that isn't represented by them, um, and how people found their way into the marketplace um, and into uh, you know, what we always talk about in America as you know, increasing access um, to um, you know, the, the American dream. Um, and we see some of the beginnings of that here because this is a very much a conjunction here of pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary craft um, and the building of um, trade, consumption, uh, marketing um, over time that provides access to people who previously did not have access to those things. Judy, you've been at the Rosenbach for many years now. You've stewarded this collection, uh, you know, at both in the intellectual sense of understanding it uh, and interpreting it to our public and in the sense of caring for it and preserving it for future generations. What role do you think the Rosenbach, and for that matter, other similar institutions, um, play in our democratic society? What is the importance of, of an historic house museum, of a special collections library, to our broad civic, broader civic culture today? Well, you know, from my perspective, um, as you know, a, a working intellectual, um, the work that I did doing the research I did here at the Rosenbach and the work that I continue to do in, in stewarding the collections. I think that um, historic institutions, uh, you know, people who talk about history and literature, really have an obligation to um, speak clearly and honestly um, about the past, um, about the past that is reflected in these objects, um, and to bring forth aspects of the collections they have that um, underline um, agency of the creators, um, whoever they are, and to try to find as many of those stories to tell as we possibly can, to be inclusive in that regard. Um, but also to recognize the difficulties that societies have, particularly a democratic culture, um, in uh, you know just finding out you know who and what it is, um, and how those things derive from the past, and um, those stories get told again and again and again on the road from um, their origin to um, not their conclusion, but their continual remaking um, in our time and in the future. Um, those are questions that we can ask of these objects, um, both as professionals and um, as visitors and researchers um, that we welcome here. Um, you know, just what do we make of this? And in trying to be transparent and, um, and just, you know, open-hearted about um, how we how we talk about these objects. They're not here just to be admired and put on a pedestal. They're here to interrogate. Um, and we need to be able to do that in order to um, enable people to you know, bring, bring the, the past and the present together in their own lives and their own communities. Judy, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. I think it's a wonderful uh, introduction to this particular space at our at our museum, the parlor, but also uh, really establishes a, a useful way of thinking about the work we do here interrogating objects. So I appreciate your joining me for this episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. 
Thanks so much for having me, Alex. Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, literature, and culture. In the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast, I'll speak with the Rosenbach's legendary librarian, Elizabeth E. Fuller, who knows our books and manuscripts better than anyone else and will give us a taste of what it's like to visit the Rosenbach to do research here. It'll be a fun conversation, so check it out soon. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, including house tours, and always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections, including those that Judy and I discussed today. Our holdings are always accessible to those who make a free research appointment. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. Thank you for your support. If you enjoy the introductory and concluding music featured on the podcast, which was composed and performed by Rosenbach Board of Directors member Yolanda Wisher and her band The Afro Eaters, and was recorded at WRTI 90.1 in Philadelphia for NPR Live Sessions, visit WRTI.org to learn more. Also, please consider purchasing Yolanda Wisher's new album. Just visit Rosenbach.org for information. The Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast.